Uh, okay, everyone, thanks for um, sticking around. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend, first and colleague, second, uh, uh, <laughs> Johannes, who is um, uh, really a specialist in, uh, in stochastic analysis, especially uh, martingale theory, um, and uh, also is uh, still working on, on things related to stochastic portfolio theory, which is uh, what he, well, and I uh, started with uh, in, uh, back, back in uh, Columbia days. Um, so he will be talking about some new uh, things on uh, function generation of trading strategies. Thank you very much. So thanks also for sticking around. Thanks to Luciano and Costas for organizing this conference, and many thanks for, uh, to Winton for free lunch uh, and hosting us. So but I have an abstract, uh, and it's a lie. So the abstract, I'm not, I changed slightly the talk and the content of this talk. So don't read the abstract, please. So what I'm presenting is a joint work with uh, two people, Bob Fernholz and uh, Janis Karatzas. So Bob Fernholz, uh, many people of you will remember him. He gave a talk here exactly one year ago about a related topic. And uh, yeah, many people of you also know Janis Karatzas. So lots of uh, people who, you can read all the names and it's an incomplete list who worked on this topic. And what I want to do is I want first to start with giving an overview of stochastic portfolio theory, a crash course on stochastic portfolio theory, but only for like 15 minutes and then talk about the functional generation of uh, uh, trading strategies. So this is uh, the outline of my talk now. I, I want to start with a few slides on something which is in stochastic portfolio theory called abstract markets. And then I want to give a few slides on the arithmetics of returns. So arithmetics of returns, we only need to know how to divide and multiply numbers. And abstract markets, there will be only a picture. So not a lot of math. And then at the uh, second part of the talk, I want to talk about this functional generation. So stochastic portfolio theory is basically, is a field which is started by uh, Bob Fernholz in the 70s and 80s. And he, what he was, he was a professor at Princeton and then he wanted to make money and he started a uh, asset management firm and uh, his firm focused on equity markets. So all of this, uh, what I'm presenting here, think about equity markets. And in, well, uh, the data and so what I have here is mostly US equity markets. <laughs> And he needed to have a framework to describe this market and to look at the empirical uh, features of such a market. Uh, and for this, he started uh, what he later called stochastic portfolio theory in contrast to modern portfolio theory of Markowitz. And uh, this area of stochastic portfolio theory uh, nowadays focuses on two uh, different domains. One domain is modeling of abstract markets. And the second domain is what I call arithmetic of returns everything which is connected to arbitrage, how to measure returns, etc. So here, a mathematical, I said only multiplications and so on, so if you don't like too much math, for, just forget this slide. So everything on this context is uh, probability space, and I have a filtration, so standard uh, probability setup. I'm fixing a number D, D is the number of assets. So currently we have in the SP500, not 500 stocks, but 505. So think, for example, if you model the SP500, about 505 or if you model the whole uh, US stock uh, universe, which is traded on major uh, uh, exchanges, this is the, the number of shares would be, so this is end of December last year, 4,100. So this is a big number, it's all the different assets which, which are traded. We model these assets by continuous semi-martingales. You can add chumps, but it's getting just more complicated. Uh, and each of the semi-martingales, so we have D semi-martingales, each of the semi-martingales does not represent the price of a share, but the price of the share times the number of outstanding uh, shares. So this is the total market capitalization, right? So Apple maybe trades at $600, or actually I don't know the number, but it trades at a number X. So we don't use $600, but we take $600 times the number of shares, total market capitalization. This is just to normalize, right? To, to get uh, uh, capitalizations, so we can compare capitaliza capitalizations. So it's only, we need, sorry, we need uh, continuous semi-martingales, but uh, so we can think, for example, about S being modeled as uh, such an E2 diffusion. So there will be no bond here in these slides, so this is just for simplicity, so no risk-free asset, only shares. 
now. Sigma, I will call the total market capitalization. So this is all the money which is currently in the market, invested in, in the stock market. And just the sum of the individual stock price capitalizations. So Sigma. And now I will make one assumption, which is hopefully not a very big assumption. I will assume that the capitalizations, the sum of the capitalizations never dies. So it will, we will always have some money traded, right? So if you have these stocks, yeah. so there's always a little bit of value in here. And now I'm introducing some, a little, one more piece of notation, but this is very important notation. Mu i's, these are market rates. So the, uh, I'm taking my capitalization of, take your favorite company, and divide it by the total market capitalization. What you will get is, you will get a number between zero and one, hopefully. Um, and I call this market rate of the ice company. So if we check the mass, if we sum up all these guys, we get exactly one, right? This is the definition of sigma. So these guys, the vector of these market weights lives in the simplex, which I, call, which I call delta d. And the simplex is exactly a hyperplane in the d-dimensional space. And uh, so that the components sum up to one. And then I take the positive part. Okay. And here a picture how this looks like with empirical data. So I uh, fixed a couple of dates. So these dates are more or less chosen at random. So I started, let's say, end of June 1926. Why 1926? Because this is where my data start. And then I look again 20 years later, 46, 66, 86, 2006, and then again last June. And I look, each of these years, I have a different number of shares, right? 1926, we have a different number of shares being traded than 1946 and 1986, okay? So 1946 is the blue line, which is the line which is on the very left. So let's focus on this blue line. This is 1926. So what this tells us, on the x-axis, we have the ranks. On the y-axis, we have the weights in log scale. So we take the biggest stock. So I look at rank by rank, I mean, what is uh, rank relative to the other stocks? We measure everything in capitalizations, right? So we can compare things. So I go to 1926. The biggest stock 1926 is, I believe it's AT&T. Uh, um, what is the proportion of the biggest stock with respect to the market capitalization? What is the mu of AT&T? And I plot it here. It's maybe 7, 8%. Then I go to the second largest stock. I, I go a little bit to the right, and I plot it again here, and so on. So this is the blue line here. Now I do the same game, 1946. This will be the green line. And we see, on the, uh, well, we can see two things. First of all, on the left-hand side, it's very, very stable, right? So 1946 is a very different economic regime than 1926. 1986 is, again, a very different economic regime. So we, we have very different economic regimes, but somehow we can observe this stationary behavior in these market rates. So these market rates are very uh, stationary. Um, on the right-hand side, we would expect that this differs, right? So because we have different numbers of shares. For example, uh, uh, 1986, we had roughly uh, uh, maybe 7,000 shares, 7,000 7, different names outstanding. Nowadays, we only have 4,000 names outstanding. So then actually, the number of names went down uh, in the last 20 years in the, in the US. This is a US-specific phenomenon. So. Uh, um, but uh, so on the right hand side, of course, it will differ because we have different numbers of shares. But I think the important message of this picture is that on the, uh, the upper side here, things are extremely uh, constant and uh, stationary. So of course, you have fluctuations, but they always stay very close to this mean. And you can do this for all other dates, too. So there's nothing specific about these dates. And this is a story about abstract markets. So it's not easy. It's quite difficult to write actually down a tractable model, which of the capitalizations such that uh, if you plug, if you uh, simulate this model, or if you compute this model, so that you get exactly a curve like uh, the empirical data I have. So it's we are very good in financial mass. We are very good in modeling one-dimensional stock prices, right? We we have stochastic volatility. We have Black-Scholes. We have rough volatility. So this is in honor of uh, Jim. Uh, so we are quite good. You're on. You're on. <laughs> Inside the joke. joke uh, uh, so we are quite good in modeling one-dimensional stock prices, but we are still not very good in modeling higher-dimensional stock prices. It's not enough just to take 1,000 uh, one-dimensional stock prices and put them next to each other. 
you would not get a very uh, nice behavior. So somehow the stocks interact with each other. And uh, um, so the story about abstract markets is uh, how to create models which reflect behavior like I have here. This is something which you don't need any statistics, right? This is just something which you can observe. So there's no yeah, inference, statistical inference. It's just, it's just, these are just numbers. Uh, so of course, modeling something like this, you can just model with something which is constant, right? Just make a market model where everything is constant and you get something like this, right? So this is not interesting. I mean something tractable. For example, also you can measure how fast you move these ranks, right? If you're the top stock, how long does it take you to go to the second largest place, third largest place, and so on? And this is something that you can measure. And uh, now the goal of abstract markets in stochastic portfolio theory is uh, uh, to create uh, models which, which reflect this. This is all what I wanted to say about abstract markets. So this is one big part of uh, stochastic portfolio theory. And now I want to move on to uh, returns. And I want to start with uh, the definition of return. So I hope we don't have any arguments about, uh, <laughs> so this is a good definition how we can measure what a return is. We take uh, tomorrow's value, we subtract today's value, and we divide it by today's value, right? Uh, this is a number, yeah, and we call it return. Uh, however, now think about that you want to aggregate different returns, right? So you have a return for each day, you want to aggregate these returns. You have a certain st trading strategy, the trading strategy invests maybe in uh, certain factors, and now you want to uh, uh, you want to aggregate these returns, and from here on, people uh, start disagreeing because you can aggregate in many different ways. So you can have uh, sorry, you can have uh, just the arithmetic return. You can look at the geometric return, or you can look at the logarithmic return, right? And probably you saw all of the three aggregations at some point. So let's discuss these three returns a little bit more. Arithmetic return. This is the return which, you know, when we teach cap M and so on, this is exactly uh, what we teach, right? Because this is the uh, returns which come from this factor uh, asset pricing models. You do some regression and you, you take some averages. So arithmetic returns, something which is connected to modern portfolio theory. However, Mathematically, these guys are quite strange, right? So in the standard example, if your stock goes up by 100% and goes down by 50%, you have made not any, you made no money, right? But you have positive return. Um, next, the geometric return. It's just, it's a little bit difficult to compute. Okay, I don't want to say much more, but it's, it's also, it's, it's quite strange. Now, logarithmic return. This is the return which uh, I will use later on, and which is the main return in stochastic portfolio theory. And I, want, I will motivate this a little bit more. But first, let's uh, compare these three returns to each other. And we have this inequality. So this is just Jensen's inequality. Arithmetic returns are always bigger than geometric returns, are always bigger than logarithmic returns. So if you own a hedge fund, and, you're, right, and you uh, give your customers a sharp ratio, you have different options how you compute the numerator, right? Uh, you want to go for the arithmetic return, <laughs> right? Uh, and I think this is what is done. Uh, yeah. If you invest somewhere, ask for the logarithmic return. So let's do a little bit of computations with these returns. So let's take a standard Black-Scholes model, or I don't care whether this is deterministic or stochastic. And uh, so we have one stock, send this guy, this drift, we call sometimes also return, right? This is the instantaneous return. It's the instantaneous relative change, this B. What is the logarithmic return in this case? It's just, we just use Ito's formula. I take the log of S, and what I get from Ito's formula is just, it's the, the logarithmic return is just the arithmetic return minus one over two sigma squared. So this is another proof that logarithmic returns are smaller than arithmetic returns. We can even, chances inequality doesn't give us anything about the size, how big this is the difference. But this formula gives us the si difference is exactly one over two times the volatility. Okay. Now, one argument why logarithmic returns are very important. If you think about long time horizons, and throughout this talk from now on, I will, I will think about long time horizons. You want to measure your long time uh, wealth evolution. 
So what you can do is you can look at the log of your wells, in this case the stock price, and if you subtract a, 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 a G, which is the logarithmic return, then you will get exactly zero in the limit. So what this tells us is that the logarithmic return is a very good uh, estimator. You want to use look at logarithmic return if you want to look at long-term behavior, what happens in the long term. Um, geometric return does not have this uh, feature. So now, at this point, I talked about one stock. So the next question would be, what is if I aggregate several stocks? All right, this is a natural question to ask. And here it is. So first of all, it's at least going back to Markowitz, but maybe even earlier. So Markowitz observed that if you take arithmetic returns, so first of all, let me digress. Let's look at the portfolio. So portfolio is just a, a vector pi, and each of the components of the vector is the proportion of wells I invest in each of the stocks. So this is what I call portfolio here. Uh, so they have to sum up to one. So Marco, it's due to Markowitz who observed that if I look at the arithmetic returns, remember these are the arithmetic returns, I can just uh, average the arithmetic returns according to my portfolio weights, and I get exactly the arithmetic return of my uh, uh, whole wealth process. So this is something very nice. Now for log returns, it's a little bit more complicated. If we want to compute the uh, log return, what we do is, so on the left-hand side we have the log return, on the right-hand side we have a sum of two components. The first component is the average of the log returns of each of the constituents of my portfolio, but then I'm adding something. And again, this just comes from Ito's formula. I'm not writing down what this uh, gamma star is, but you can just explicitly compute it. It's not very difficult to compute. Um, so what we see here, we can call this, this is maybe, here what we see is the benefits of diversification, right? So with arithmetic returns, you don't see any benefits of diversification. Here you see benefits of diversification. The uh, holding a portfolio, the average uh, return of your stocks uh, it's not uh, it's not a good uh, representation of the average return of your uh, um, portfolio, but you have you gain something more, and this something more is basically uh, is, comes from diversification. So if the portfolio is long only, so uh, all the components of my vector pi are non-negative, then this uh, uh, guy you can show is always non-negative. And I want to make one more observation. No, it's a claim. It's not an observation, but it's a claim which I'm making and you have to trust me. This gamma star only depends on the volatility of volatility matrix of S. It does not depend on the drifts of S. It only depends on the volatility. So it's much more easy to estimate, right? So let's summarize the slide. If I look at log returns of a portfolio of, of a wealth process corresponding to a portfolio, it's the average of my log returns plus in excess growth term, in uh, an extra drift term, which only depends on the volatility. So we have, this here depends somehow on the, somehow on the drift of S also, but this is the second part only on the volatility. So now, before I'm now going to some trading strategies, uh, uh, let me make a simple com uh, uh, comment that most, many systematic trading strategies are not name-based, but only rank-based. So you don't trade uh, in a stock because, uh, in Apple, for example, because it's Apple, but because you trade maybe because it's the biggest stock, right? So if you do, for example, size, uh, if you trade this factor on size or something like this. So it kind of makes sense um, to look now at uh, uh, ranked, at, at ranked uh, stocks, right? So the biggest stock would be right now Apple, but you don't trade it because it's Apple maybe, but because it has, a, it has the biggest size, right? So and this is what I want to do on the next uh, three slides. So S is again a capitalization, right? So think about Apple or British Telecom or whatever. And R is the rank of S. So the rank of Apple would be one, for example. The rank of uh, uh, Enron would be infinity or so, right? Because it's zero, it's, it's, it disappears. Um, and what I'm defining here is now the average rank-based growth rate. So what, what do I have on the right-hand side? On the right-hand side, I have a, a sum of indicators. Only one of these indicators, so first of all, I fix K. Let me fix K, so K is a rank. 
k is equal to 1 or k is equal to 800. 800 would be the 800 sludge stock. So now, this indicator is only one time one and, and otherwise zero. It's one if and only if my current stock is ranked 800, otherwise it's zero, right? So I have a sum here, but it's not, it wants to be a sum, but it's not really a sum, right? Only one of these terms is a non-zero. And so I'm looking at, so what this sum is doing is, I'm looking at my 800th largest stock here, and I look at the return of the stock. So any point of time, I check uh, what is the 800th longest largest stock, I check its return, I sum it up, and I take the, uh, diff, uh, take the average, right? And this is something like my log return for the 800th largest stock. Does this definition make sense? So this I can estimate from the data now, right? I know, I know, I know that estimating drift is very difficult, and we will see this in the picture in a minute, but in theory I can, I can estimate it, right? So what do I do? I, do, I look at daily returns. I do this since, uh, um, the, all daily re returns since 1962. Why 1962? Because uh, 1962, uh, since, uh, because since 1962 I have at least 1,000 stocks in the database, let's say it like this. Um, and what I will show in the next uh, slide is, is, is again a picture where on the x-axis I have ranks, the k's, and on the y-axis I have the log returns. And here we go. Forget for the moment about this uh, line in the middle. So what I have here is uh, I start at 1. I look at the return of my largest stock. I average it over time, and I get a number here, somewhere here. So then I look at the second largest return, and I get another number somewhere else. What we can see is there's a lot of noise, right? So it's very, very difficult to estimate drifts. So there's no reason why the 600, so there's no economic reason why the 600 largest stock should be very different from the 601st largest stock, right? But uh, so this is just intrinsic difficulty in the data. Uh, so there's a lot of noise. Almost nothing can be said here. Uh, however, you can also not say that the log returns are increasing as rank increases, right? So this data don't confirm that there's a size effect in returns. Keep in mind, I'm looking at log returns, not at returns, right? In traditional asset pricing, empirical asset pricing, people look at returns, asymmetric returns. I look at uh, uh, log returns. So there's no size effect at all. So you can uh, draw a regression line, and yeah, it's difficult to see, but uh, the regression line, including the confidence interval, has negative slope. So uh, almost no slope, but if any slopes are negative. And the normal size effect would, uh, I guess, say that the smallest stock would have uh, uh, the largest uh, uh, drift, right? So this is yeah, what people call size effect. Um, but at least equity data in the US, if you look at ranked equity data, don't confirm uh, this uh, uh, feature at all. So on the next, I have one more slide. I'm taking the same picture. I can just show you. And I just removed the regression line. What I'm plotting on top of this is the estimate of the volatility. So I can compute either the sample mean, right, of the log returns, and I get the blue dots, or I can, for each rank, compute the volatility. It's just a standard sample devi deviation. I multiply this volatility, I get the variance, and I divide by two, right? I have one over two sigma squared. So each of these blue dot, each of these green dots, and nothing is smoothed out here or anything, right? So each of these uh, green dots, I take, for example, again, the 600 largest stock, at any point of time, I measure this return, I measure the standard deviation of this, uh, of these returns, and I get a blue dot. Um, it's, uh, what we can see is, it's much easier to estimate standard deviations, right? Uh, it's extremely easy to measure standard deviations, there's almost no noise here, it's, it's basically a flat line. So there's a little bit uh, strange going on for the top five stocks, but uh, this is for a different reason. Otherwise, it's basically a straight line. So now if you remember, if you go back to, uh, if you remember the first slide, or one of the first slides, when we said the arithmetic return is logarithmic return plus one over two sigma squared. So now unfortunately I don't have the slide, but if you just do the same game for arithmetic returns, you get again a picture with a lot of blue dots all over the place. You do a regression line for these blue dots, and then on top of this regression line for the arithmetic returns, you put the regression line of, uh, you put the sum of the regression line of uh, my last plot plus the green dot, it's tot it totally agrees. So what this slide is telling us is that um, 
what this slide uh, will tell us is, or should tell us is, there is a size effect if you look at arithmetic returns, but it's coming purely from the volatility, purely from this one over two sigma squared. Otherwise, uh, no effect at all. And if you look at logarithmic returns, it's even negative. So, yeah. For the exactly, of the arithmetic returns. And it is still increasing? Because the, the, the then it's, yes, it's still increasing because the uh, regression line here is basically, basically constant. How good is the fit? Pardon? Yeah. How good is your fit of the line? Is it uh, Pretty good. Fit, very poor fit? Pardon? Is it a very poor fit or a very It's a very good fit. Uh, How would it's a very good fit for... for pardon? What's the R squared, for example? Doesn't I, look a good fit to me. But. Pardon? <laughs> no, but I didn't give you the. I didn't give you. No, no, no. I didn't give you the. Uh, I didn't show you the arithmetic. I didn't show you the arithmetic return regression line. No. I didn't show you. This is this is the regression line of the logarithmic returns. I do the same picture again for arithmetic returns. I get an increasing line. So there are no limits up and down, plus and minus. So it's difficult to say. The line is not very clear to me. You can almost draw another line anywhere else. Here, I, uh, yes, yes, I, 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 I take a point. I, I, I take a point, right? Uh, I take a point that this is uh, there's so much noise. This line is not really trustworthy, right? So uh, I take a point. But I think what I'm commenting on is just that uh, people do this line, usually with arithmetic returns, and observe an increasing line. And this is one of the factors in Farmer French, right? So a uh, size. Um, but you can decompose this line as a sum of two other lines of the line before and, and this one. And this is exactly what the math tells you what should come out. Um, yeah. So maybe the important thing from this slide is that returns don't seem to matter too much. And maybe if you do such an abstract market model, if you model something, you can just keep maybe the, the drifts totally constant. Uh, most of these effects come from the volatility. So the volatility is important the drifts don't seem to be so important. And this is also uh, now in the second part, which will be a little bit more mathematical. Uh, uh, I will, uh, in the second part of this talk, I will discuss trading strategies, which are somehow very intrinsically connected to volatility and not to drifts. So again, we can see it's that the performance of the trading strategies, which, we, uh, which I will present in a minute, uh, mostly depend on volatility and not at all at drift, actually. And this is just very consistent to the last two plots from before. So now I'm ready for the second part of this talk. And uh, this is like titled Functional Generation of Trading Strategies. And I'll give you a summary of, uh, of what comes on the next 10 slides now. So you can think about what you're doing in the next 10 slides. So you take any function with as domain the positive simplex. Uh, right? This is where the market rates live. You assume that this function is C2. And then you look at the gradient of this function. The gradient of this function is something which is well defined and it has d components, right? Because it was a function on the d dimensional simplex. And each of these d components you interpret as a, a trading strategy. And then you follow this trading strategy. And then this is what I want to study in the next 10 slides how, uh, how, how we can study this trading strategy and what, what can we learn from this trading strategy, from this class of trading strategies. So because it's already 20 minutes ago, let me just repeat a uh, notation. D is the number of shares, 5,000, 4,000, 500, whatever you like. No negative semi-martingales, no bond, market rates are mu i's, and say so take value in this simplex, right? So if I sum up all my market rates, I get one, and each market rate is non-negative, okay? Sigma was just a total market capitalization. So now I want to make one one theoretical uh, observation is this mu i's are market rates, but I can think actually in my mind, in our mind, we can think about this market rates as prices, right? Assets are capitalization, there's something like prices. If I assume that every share, every stock only has one share outstanding, so assets are prices. What I'm doing here is what we would call in financial mass change of numeraire, right? So I'm expressing one price in terms of another price. So the mu's are prices, the mu, mu, Mu 600 is the price of the 600s company expressed in terms of the total market capitalization, right? It's a number between zero and one. If the number is, let's say, 0.05, it just means this share costs me right now, or this stock costs me right now 5% of the total market. 
Right? This is just standard change of numerator technique. Okay, so in your mind, you can think about the mu's as prices and say sum up, but this price is sum up to one. Now, because I'm, uh, 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 I'm in the hedge fund, so I'm, what I'm doing is, so this is a disclaimer. I'm not trying to sell you a strategy. Uh, in particular, I'm going to assume that we have uh, infinite capacity, so uh, what we call small investor, right? So, we, uh, so there's no problem of uh, uh, somehow influencing the market by investing. And very important, in everything what I'm showing you, is there's no trading costs, right? So uh, uh, the analysis will get much more difficult if you include trading costs. Uh, uh, so this is, if anything, just a proof of concept, but no, uh, no, uh, nothing which you can... So this is something which you cannot pitch to a hedge fund, right? Uh, so this is not a pitch of a trading strategy. Um, so let me define trading strategy. So a uh, trading strategy is something which is RD dimensional. Each of the components will tell you the number, the number of units which you hold uh, of each stock. And uh, so if I have this number, I multiply it by my prices, I get my uh, total uh, 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 price which I follow, right? Of course, the prices here are expressed in terms of markets, in terms of the total market capitalization. So theta is, uh, uh, theta is, think about the number of shares, maybe in the traditional setup, think about mu as the prices, then B is just number of shares, a number of units, I should say, maybe, times price, and I sum it up. This yet is not a trading strategy yet, right? We all know this is not a trading strategy. In order that such a process becomes a trading strategy, the self-financing conditions should hold, and the self-financing condition just means if I look at the difference between my wells today and my wells at time zero, it must be the same as my wells which I get from trading in the underlyings. So uh, this is, right, so number of shares I hold times the changes in price. So this is my, my gains and losses on the right-hand side. And my gains and losses should just agree exactly with the difference in my wells process. Okay, so if this condition holds, then I call theta a, a, a trading strategy. So now I also want to talk a little bit about arbitrage. So let me define arbitrage. And this is just a standard definition of arbitrage, of, of simple arbitrage. Really. You start at time zero with one. At time uh, little t, you're always no negative. And at time capital T, you're at least one and strictly bigger than one with positive probability, right? This is, should be no argument that this is a good notion of arbitrage. Now I call it relative arbitrage. Just to keep in mind, to remind ourselves that this is not really arbitrage with respect to a bond, but this is arbitrage, you know, I changed my numeral, right? So this is all arbitrage. One means one market, one unit of the market. So, um, so I start with one unit of the market, and at the end, at time capital T, I have something strictly more than one unit of the market. So it's not bonds, but it's yeah, units of markets. But mathematically, it's the same. Okay. So if you remember, I mentioned uh, I start with a function, then I take the gradient of this function, and then I, out of the gradient, I want to make a trading strategy. So here, think about theta on this slide as the gradient of our function later on. So theta is now a, 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 um, any process, which is not yet a trading strategy. And think about theta as the gradient of my function. And it's not yet a trading strategy, so why not? because this process might not be zero. So this is my value according to this uh, trading, according to this process, minus my value at time zero, minus my, my gains and losses. If this is not zero, theta itself was not a trading strategy. And uh, let's call this Q of theta, this is like the defect of, or lack of self-financing, uh, the self-financeability of this theta, okay? So theta is the gradient later on, it's not yet a trading strategy. However, what I want to show here, it easily can be turned into a trading strategy. How do you turn it into a trading strategy? You just take your original theta and you subtract this process. This process is the same for all unit, for all eyes. Okay? And this, this is just a standard trick of financial math just put into uh, this context of uh, strange prices and so on. So, um, what I have here, now phi, so there's a little lemma behind, uh, behind the wall, which says that uh, uh, phi, which is the, my original process theta, which was just arbitrary, minus this process Q, will be a trading strategy. And moreover, 
the value of my trading strategy is just my value at times zero plus, and here I can plug in either theta or phi, right? If, if I would plug in phi, then this is exactly the definition of trading strategy. And this lemma says I can also plug in theta here. So the value, if I invest according to phi, can be represented like this. Okay, so the important message from this slide is if you take in this market model where the sum of stocks is all, uh, the sum of prices is one, if you take anything which is -dimension, any d-dimensional process, you can always turn it into a trading strategy by simply uh, adjusting for the lack of self-financing stuff, okay? So this is the only thing I think which is uh, relevant from this slide. And now let's go from the uh, functions to the trading strategies. So now let's make the big step. So let's give ourselves a C2 function G. Uh, um, so I'm going to call this function G generating function because it will generate a trading strategy. And then let's apply Etus formula, right? So whenever you see a C2 function in a stochastic process, the first thing that we should do is applying Etus formula. So this is what I'm doing here. Uh, but I'm rewriting it a little bit. So, uh, so this is G of mu T minus G at times zero, right? This is exactly the left-hand side of Etus formula is equal to a stochastic integral on the right-hand side minus or plus a second-order term, right? 1 over 2 times the uh, uh, Hessian. But I bring the second-order term on the left-hand side, right? And I um, multiply it by, with a minus sign. And this is what happens here, right? So if you plug this here in on this side and put it on the other side, you really have, this is just Etus formula. So there's nothing, there's nothing mysterious. It's a lot of notation, but it's just Etus formula. Um, one, one important observation already is that this process gamma g does not depend on the drift here somehow, right? So if I can observe somehow the quadratic variations, if I know my function g, I know of course my market weights, I can just read them off. If I know my quadratic variations and covariations, and of course I know it's not very easy to estimate quadratic covariations, but if I know them, uh, uh, I can just easily compute this process. So. Now, the right-hand side here looks, it looks like uh, gains and losses from a uh, portfolio process, but it's not, right? Because it, the self-financing condition doesn't hold. However, on the last slide, I just tried to convince you that this is not a really a problem. You can, you can just turn it very easily by adding a simple process, an easy process to it. Uh, you can uh, turn it into a trading strategy. And uh, you have exactly the same dynamics here, right? So I could just write this, and I could have never discussed the lack of self-financing condition, and Maybe I could have cheated you through, right? But uh, it's not really a problem. You just turn it into self-financing condition. Uh, you just correct for the lack of self-financing condition. And uh, then you have something where on the right-hand side you can interpret now as the gains and losses from a trading strategy. And this is, yeah, it's on the last bullet point, but uh, uh, the last bullet point basically uh, tells me it just translates this to classic integral because phi is now a trading strategy as my... Uh, Gay my, my wells today minus my wells at times zero. Okay. So nothing, this is just very simple, right? Uh, uh, stochastic analysis, nothing, nothing complicated going on here. So now a little bit more notation, but not really uh, essential. So I'm taking my trading strategy from before. Here it is. This is the lack of self-financing uh, correction term. And so I'm just adding a constant. Don't worry about the constant, it's just to make the formulas a little bit easier, right? I can just add and subtract the, you know, I just start with a little bit more capital. Uh, and so this trading strategy now, this trading strategy phi, I, I say this is additively generated by chi. So chi was a C2 function, I take the gradient of chi, I plug into the gradient, my market weights mu, I get a stochastic process, this stochastic process I interpret as trading strategy. And this is, I call additively generated. Why additively? Because there's also something called multiplicative, but I'm not going to discuss it, because additive is a little bit easier. And now one first proposition, and I don't even need a proof because the proof is somehow on the uh, on the last few slides. If I invest according to this trading strategy, I get this formula, and this formula is sometimes called master equation in stochastic portfolio theory, because it's. Uh, um, it's quite powerful, and we see a little bit of this power in, in, in a few minutes. So my wealth process of my trading strategy can be represented as my function evaluated at mu plus my gamma process 
my gamma process was just the sum of these quadratic variations and covariations and so on, weighted by the Hessian. So this is an easy consequence, basically, from, from, from how we defined phi. However, it's quite powerful. Why? Because usually, when you construct Wells processes of uh, uh, trading strategies, you have to compute a stochastic integral, right? Let's go back. So here, this is a stochastic integral, right? And stochastic integrals somehow are usually difficult to compute. Um, but this formula allows you to express this, uh, uh, the gains and losses from our uh, trading without computing a stochastic integral, right? You can think of, yeah. And everything here, you, at least this term, you can just read off the market. And this here, you have to be able to estimate variances and covariances. Not the inverses, right? Like in Markowitz, you have to estimate inverses of variances and covariances. So it's not as difficult. You only have to get the covariance matrix straight. And often, it's even enough to have the diagonal uh, straight. Moreover, so we can express, so this first observation, we can express the Wells process as a sum of two terms. And moreover, we can express uh, our trading strategy like this. And this needs a little bit of computations, but it's not very complicated. So you look at the gradient of G, and then you do some correction, right? This is basically what was hidden in this correction term Q from before, if you just compute it. So again, this is quite easy uh, to compute, right? So you don't need to know very much from the market. So now, one more definition to uh, connect it to the title of at least of what's written in the abstract. Uh, if this process gamma g is non-decreasing, so gamma g was just a second order term, right? Uh, Hessian multiplied with the quadratic covariations. If this is non-decreasing, then I call g a Lyapunov function. For example, if g is concave, this guy will be a Lyapunov function. And now, a theorem, and I write on the bottom idea of a proof, but I think it's almost complete, the proof, right? So it's maybe not a big theorem, if the proof is one line. Um, so fix a Lyapunov function g. So Lyapunov function was just a C2 function, let's say, where the second order term is not decreasing. Let's say we normalize it so that we start in one. And suppose that we have this condition, this probability one. We have set gamma of g, so this is the second order term, is at least one at time t star. Then, if this condition holds with probability one, then this strategy phi, which is generated by this function g, is actually a strong arbitrage. By strong arbitrage, I mean just, just think about arbitrage. It's an arbitrage with respect to the market. And this is holds for all long time horizons. But what this gives us here, this statement, is something which is empirically more or less, you can check this, right? You can compute from the market what gamma g is. You can compute what gamma g is in the past, and then you can, if you assume that also in the future, gamma g will uh, move in the same way, then uh, this is something which, at least it can be empirical checked, right? Uh, so it says, again, no drift estimates at all, right? Only variances and covariances. So what's the idea of the proof? This is just the equality which we had on the first uh, a few slides ago. The Wells process can be expressed as a sum of two terms. Now, uh, this term is increasing, g is always no negative, so I have this inequality, and this by assumption is bigger than one. And this is exactly what arbitrage should be, right? So here, this functional generation gives you, uh, uh, gives you empirical conditions under which you have arbitrage over very long time horizons, right? So I haven't said anything about this time horizon, t star, and uh, this somehow needs to be then estimated from the data. Um, let me make one more important remark. I comment very briefly on it. But as long as you have any market model which satisfies this, right? So you have any model which satisfies this condition, then this st strategy does not depend on any, anything in the market model. So this is just a gradient of G, right? So there's nothing of the model comes in. This is just G of mu. And this, again, you can just read off the market. So it's the same strategy for all models. Here, you need something... For this term, you need to know a little bit about the quadratic variation and the quadratic correlation. So, at, so well, to be precise, this is a strategy which is independent of the choice of model, as long as the model has a set, as long as we are not changing the covariance structure of the model. So this does not depend 
on the choice of model, and it does not depend on the time horizon as long as the time horizon is long enough. Now, on the last uh, three slides, I'd like to discuss one example. And the example I'm choosing here is uh, the entropy function. So the entropy function, this is just, there might be a minus missing. Is this function concave? So whatever the concave version of this function, either minus or not, uh, it's probably weak. Yeah. Is it true? Okay, a minus, okay. So you take the minus of h, um, minus of this uh, process, and uh, um, now think about, uh, let's plug in a couple of different uh, values for this function. So the x traits are my market rates, right? So I live in the simplex. One extreme example for my market would be all the mu one is one, and all the other mu's are zero. This would correspond to one stock took over the whole market, right? In this case, this function is just zero, right? Now let's plug in another example. Another example is we have these stocks. Every, each of the market weights corresponding to each of the stocks is exactly one over D. So it's totally uh, diverse. What is then this function? It's uh, one of D times log one over D, which is uh, roughly one over D if you compute it. Or yeah, you, it's easy to compute, but it's, it's much bigger than zero if you put a minus sign in front of it. So how you can integrate this h is, okay, it has this information theoretic uh, foundation, but in this context, you can just integrate it as a measure of diversity. So if h is large, the market is very diverse, so it's the largest if all the stocks have exactly one over d. If uh, h is very small, the market is very non-diverse. For example, if all the market uh, capitalization is aggregated in one stock, right? So think about h as a measure of diversity of your current market configuration. And if you put a minus sign, it's concave. So in particular, it's a Lyapunov function. And now I can compute the second uh, derivative of this guy. So uh, um, this might take a few minutes or not. But uh, you compute the first derivative and then the second derivative. What you see is that the cross terms all disappear. And uh, you just sum up over the quadratic variations, multiplied by the Hessian. And the Hessian here will be just exactly 1 over x. So this is. Um, my second order term. And now, the statement from before was, if this guy is strictly increasing and I can somehow bond the slope from below or I know at some time it's uh, bigger than one, then I will have arbitrage. And this is something I can read off the market again, right? So every, every point of time I know my mu chase and every point of time I know my quadratic variations. So this is a name in stochastic portfolio theory because it's one of the fundamental examples. And this is just uh, uh, the observation which I had, which I called theorem, a couple of slides ago, which said that if this is large enough, then we have arbitrage over sufficiently large time horizons. Now, we can compute the trading strategy corresponding to this H. How? You just look at the gradient of this H. You plug in your market weights mu, and you make it self-financing. And I'm, I didn't compute it, but here is uh, one slide about how, the, again, no trading costs, right? No trading costs and no market impact. How, how this is performing. Um, so say, keep in mind that two different ways how you can uh, compute this market, uh, 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 how you can compute the performance. One way is via the stochastic integral, and the other way is through the master equation, right? The stochastic integral is equal to g plus the second order term. So the blue line, which you cannot see because it's covered by another line, the blue line, uh, it's, it's covered behind this uh, yellow, brownish line. Uh, um, this line is the line when you compute it through the, uh, um, when you compute the return through the stochastic integral, through approximating the stochastic integral. At any point of time, you compute your phi, you, tell, you check what your phi gives you, and so on. Now, alternatively, you can compute this line through a sum of two components. Here we have the uh, uh, gamma component. It must be an increasing process. We know it's an increasing process, right? Because it's a sum of, it's an integral over quadratic variations. Everything is increasing, so it must be increasing. And this is how it's increasing in the data. Again, I started in 1962, and it's, I only did this with the top 1,000 stocks in the market. Um, you can also compute H, 
Remember, H is your measure of diversity, right? So and this is the green line here. It seems to be going up slightly. However, uh, uh, no, it seems to be going up, which seems to indicate that there is uh, 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 increasing diversity. Now, the theorem from before tells us if we take this number and add it to this number, we should get exactly this number. And we can see, of course, this is not true, right? Because one number is already bigger, one curve is already bigger than the other one. So again, the theorem told us that this line here should be the sum of this guy plus this guy. So in real data, this doesn't work. However, you can correct for it. Why doesn't it work with real data? Because in real data, what you have is you have dividends, you have mergers, stocks dropping out of the market, and stocks coming into the market. So let's say, for example, think about a dividend payment. You, you, you're long in the stock. You, get, you collect your dividends. But your market weights, right? The market weights don't capture this dividend payments, right? You make some return on this dividends. You have a higher returns than usual. But G, oh, sorry, H, my entropy function does not capture this. Uh, so, but you can correct for it by hand. Every day, you can just check dividends. You can check uh, what happens with the mergers and acquisitions. And how is your change in the diversity function, G? And this is what the red line is. So if you take the green line plus the red line together, then you can think about the sum of the green line plus the red line together is something like realized diversity or intrinsic diversity. Think about this sum as, in, let's say, Im implied diversity. And so if you look at, if you take the sum of these two guys, it seems to indicate that the uh, diversity actually in the market went down over the last uh, 50 years. So diversity went down, which means in this master formula you lost a little bit of money, but luckily uh, on this concave term you made a lot of money. So now if you're adding your real entropy function plus the correction term plus the uh, uh, second order term, then you get exactly uh, 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 your portfolio uh, uh, process, which you could have uh, computed via the stochastic integral. So sometimes, this is just for, some, for the experts here, this line is also called a leakage. So this is a leak by leakage because you always lose, you know, when, the index, when you reconstitute the index, especially in the bottom, you know, you're, you're selling uh, stocks which drop out and buying stocks which drop in. You always lose a little bit of money, but this is taken care here. So a uh, few papers as reference. Um, and let me uh, stop here. Thank you very much. So this example of this daily return. Daily return, end of day. I'm just concerned with transaction costs. I guess you need to have quite a bit of return off. Yeah. You have, yes. Uh, you have much, yes. Uh, yes. Um, you can do the same thing. With, if you do it quarterly and so on, qualitatively you will get the same picture. Um, and it's in real life, it's probably not uh, it's not advisable to do this daily, right? Uh, so you will qualitatively. You would be like adjusting every way, every day. In this case, yes. In this yeah, in this trivial one, yes. Uh, but uh, this is not what what you would do in real life, right? You would uh, you would choose a much much lower frequency, and you would also uh, maybe in some sense. You know, we know 1 over n is outperforming very well, but uh, we cannot implement it because it's too high transaction costs. So in some sense, it's an interpolation between holding market and 1 over n. And then you can optimize uh, whether you, yeah, you, you can optimize basically transaction costs with, with excess return. difficult to estimate the stochastic integrals, so this is where the formula helps, but the last picture that we've showed shows that it's easier to estimate the stochastic integral than to use the formula, right? Because you yes, can so change the formula. Yes, as, yes, yes. Um, it works, okay. When you do the additive generation, it seems to work uh, as well. It just seems to work exactly the same because 
computing the red curve is also not, it's not difficult. This is just, it's just accounting. So uh, um, this, is, this is just accounting, just keeping track of gains and losses. And there's a lot of account, you have to do the same accounting when you compute the stochastic integral, right? You have to take care of the dividends and you have to take care of what happens if you get delisted. Um, so now this is, I guess in this example it's equally difficult <laughs> to compute these three curves or this one curve. Uh, it works surprisingly well to approximate the stochastic integral. However, I guess as soon as you want to do some math with it and you really go to the continuous time limit, you can really do a lot with these three things when you don't have, to, you know, you, as a mathematical tool it's still very useful <laughs> to get rid of the stochastic integral, right? You can do things pathwise. E equally difficult, I guess. Yeah. Um, I, I've got a comment on your way of calculating returns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got an implicit assumption there, but it's by and hold. In fact, if you're looking over multiple different time scales, it's often easier to assume that you keep rebalancing to constant weights, just for which case you calculate the return that's exactly log price two over price one. Yes, yes. Um, I have a few slides after the thank you where I where I would where I make this point such yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's thank the harness again.